And I would now like to invite Mr. Schreiber to the stage. We are looking forward to your presentation, Inclusion Matters, Special Olympics and Health. Thank you. Well, I too would like to thank all of you for being here, for, to President Pfeiffer, to Dr. Riegler, uh, to Mark and Max, uh, our team here in Special Olympics Austria, uh, to, uh, to Peter Wheeler, my colleague, uh, who's uh, largely responsible for world games all over the world, and especially for strong commitment and relationship between Special Olympics International and our work here in, with Special Olympics Austria. Uh, I want to thank uh, Barbara for your kind introduction and for your uh, bringing everyone here. I want to thank my wife, Linda, who has accompanied me all the way from the United States. Um, and I want to thank all of the students here. I, I too, went to the university. I never saw this many students except at, like, midnight in a, in a, in a dance club. So uh, <laughs> I have no idea what kind of students uh, get up at 8.30 in the morning to come to hear a lecture in this kind of number to stand and hear a lecture. If you want to sit down, you can sit down. And if you get graded, everybody gets an A. So uh, <laughs> if you want to leave now, you can also leave. Now, I'm not authorized to do that. Um, I want to thank our youngest student, Birgitta and Andrea have brought their baby, who's here. Uh, uh, she's preparing to be a leader of Special Olympics dance, if I'm not mistaken. But uh, also, parents who bring young children to early morning lectures deserve special credit in heaven. Uh, so thank you. Thank you for coming. And if, we, if, if, if she starts to cry, that means I have to end the lecture immediately. Um, uh, but more seriously, I want to thank all of you. You know, the, the slogan uh, of the Special Olympics World, Summer, World Winter Games here in Austria is Heartbeat for the World. And if you look at Heartbeat for the World and then you look at the title of this morning's discussion, uh, Creating Health Justice, um, if we're going to be talking about creating health justice, that means we don't yet have it. That means despite all of our efforts, uh, despite the goodwill and hard work of many people at the level of policy and health training and me medical practice, that means despite large uh, worldwide movements, we're not there yet. And yet we're celebrating the heartbeat, right? And so for those of you in health, and that's all of you I gather, uh, the heart is at the core of the health of the body. Uh, the heartbeat is a metaphor we use throughout the language for passion, for commitment, for desire, for what lies deepest in you, but it's also a metaphor, it's also the real structure of the body's capacity to function. So we're here to challenge ourselves to touch our emotional heartbeat, to connect with the hearts and minds and souls of people all over the world who will be coming here from 100 nations, but also to dedicate ourselves to the justice that every heart, every physiological heart deserves. We have made progress, and Austria is at the front of that progress, but we are not there yet. And so we are here this morning, in effect, to give you, the students of this university, a sacred trust. Uh, we are giving you, we are inviting you to accept the trust of justice, the trust of equality, the trust of dignity, for people who have been denied justice, dignity, and equality all over the world, people with intellectual differences, who have been denied justice, equality, and dignity, who have been told over and over again, I'm sorry, there's nothing for you. I'm sorry you don't count. I'm sorry you're not as good. I'm sorry you don't deserve. These, this is the language that people with intellectual differences have heard for millennia, millennia all over the world. Today, we are inviting you, the students of the university here, to accept the trust to create justice in the future for those who have been denied. It is a big offer, I dare say. It is a big uh, uh, vote of confidence in you uh, that you can do it, that what has never been done in history can be done here in Austria. That with these games and with the celebration and the joy and the fun and athletes running around with their arms in the air and 
you know, snow on their goggles and wiping away tears to get to the finish line, that in those moments you can accept the idea that you can create the first generation in history that commits itself to full inclusion, unity, and justice. So let me start with uh, uh, a short uh, little story. This is, uh, this is a, a World Summer Games uh, over 20 years ago. This is in the United States, and this is the Games of 1995. And for those of you with good eyes, not like me, you can see the picture on the jumbotron. I don't know if you can tell. It's Bill Clinton. At the time, he was the president of the United States. And he attended the uh, Games in New Haven, Connecticut, and down on the field are about five or 6,000 athletes. They've all got the old-fashioned, I don't know if any of you even remember, we used to have cameras. Does anybody remember? No, they have no idea what a camera is. I gotta get rid of this story because you guys don't know anything what I'm talking about. So anyway, th this is what used to happen. You used to get a camera at a store and you'd pick it up and you'd take pictures with it. You'd push a button and then you'd take it back and they would develop film. Has anybody ever heard of film? Yes, yeah. you remember, you read about it in a history book. Okay, anyway, so they're down there with their cameras taking pictures, uh, single-use cameras, uh, and way at the top of the stadium, President Clinton is speaking. He's not down in the field for security reasons, and one of the groups of athletes uh, is a group, the, a professional photographer sees them, and they're all getting pictures of Clinton. He's way, way at the top of the stadium. But the professional photographer sees them and they've got the cameras all backwards. The lens is pointing back at their nose. And the photographer realizes they've never used a camera before, so he goes over trying to share with them, well, you've got to change uh, the picture here. Uh, and you turn it around and you look through the viewfinder and then you push the button and the athlete says, oh, thank you very much. In perfect English, he says, but if you look through the viewfinder backwards, it works like binoculars, and you can see the president clearly from a great distance away. <laughs> now, I, I want to open with this story, because the photographer looked at the athletes, and what did he do? He assumed. He assumed incompetence. He assumed disability, right? He, he looked and he said, they've got it wrong. Why did he think that? Because there were labels, uh, disability. There were labels, uh, developing country. There were labels, uh, maybe a, de uh, a country in Africa. There were labels in his mind. He's a good guy. He's there volunteering his time. He's the one who tells this story. Why? Because his blind spot was uncovered. Because he looked across and he got someone else wrong, just like all of us do. Just like all of us do, we misdiagnose one another. And this population has been misdiagnosed almost more than any group on Earth. Why? Because we saw over time Down syndrome and we assumed that that one label, that one genetic disorder, that one genetic difference would result in a life that was useless, worthless, invalid, invalid in the English language. Invalid is the unpacking of the word invalid. Handicapped. All the words that create judgment, all the judgments that create exclusion, all the exclusion that creates stigma, all the stigma that creates loneliness, in some way were captured in this moment of good intention. Good intention, not enough. We have to change the way we see one another, and we have to recognize that at the first moment of encounter, we must see ability. We cannot see disability as the primary identity. Maybe it's a diagnosis, but it's not an identity. My own story in uh, this world begins with my mother's family, and I won't, uh, you're, you're lucky, I won't do a full family slideshow. Uh, because otherwise you'd have to get extra credit. But uh, this is a picture of my mother's family. My mother is the person farthest to the left uh, uh, on their way in the mid-1930s to uh, her father at the center of the picture uh, was to become ambassador to the United Kingdom from the United States. And all nine of his children are headed uh, to the United Kingdom to London with him before World War II. Uh, and to my mother on the far left, the next uh, woman in, uh, 
there's a guy, and then there's a woman, and the next woman in is her sister, whose name was Rosemary. Rosemary was born in the early 1920s, and she was labeled, she was diagnosed mentally retarded. And in those days, as still today, that diagnosis, that one label meant that the mother was told, pulled out of the room and told, give up your child, you have a responsibility to your other children not to be distracted, not to be uh, broken hearted by this child, put her away in an institution, let someone professional take care of her, her diagnosis is hopeless mentally retarded, and my grandmother, when she heard those words, wrote in her diary, I am heartbroken. Not heartbeat, but heartbreak. Now, my grandparents made one decision uh, that, in my view, certainly changed my life, but it changed the lives of many, and that is that they decided not to put their daughter in institution, but to keep her at home. And in a picture like this, you see almost no distinction. You don't see a label, you don't see a diagnosis, you see a family. And if you look at other pictures of this family, there's my mother with her sister traveling in Europe together. My mother's on the left, my aunt Rosemary is on the right. On the left, uh, a woman of diagnosed as normal. On the right, a woman diagnosed as invalid. And here's a picture of her with her brother. Uh, and uh, so the bottom line here, which uh, I won't, again, spend too much time on, is this is a family of nine children who grew up caring about each other. The adage, the message from the parents to the brothers and sisters who did not have a diagnosis of disability was, you include your sister. You go out, you bring your sister. You have an activity, you bring your sister. You have a party, you include your sister, include your sister. And what was the world saying all at the same time? Get rid of your sister. You should be ashamed of your sister. Don't tell anyone about your sister. Hide your sister. And so into this great tension that these children were raised in, here again, a brother and a sister. You don't see a diagnosis, you see a brother and a sister. Now, for those of you of a certain age, you might recognize that the brother goes on to become the President of the United States of America. And the sister goes on to live in an institution. The brother becomes arguably, in 1961, the most powerful man on earth. This is what people would say. It may not be uh, thoroughly true, but people will say that the president of the United States is the most powerful, someday they might say the most powerful woman on earth, <laughs> but we're not talking politics here today. Uh, but the most powerful, and, and, and the sister becomes among the most powerless people on earth. But what did the brother heard his whole life? What did my mother hear her whole life? Include your sister, include your sister. What did they find in the moments of inclusion? When they were off together, when they were sailing together, when they were playing together, when the world was saying no and they were saying yes. When they were arm in arm and the world was saying be ashamed of yourself. They probably found what all of us find which is that when we give ourselves to someone else, when someone else needs us, we find our best selves, right? When we open ourselves to some difference, we find the best part of who we ourselves are. So when this young man on the left becomes the president of the United States, he challenges his country with what words? Does anybody remember? Are there any stu history students here? Okay, now I'm a teacher by training, so I can embarrass you and I can wait you out. Anybody here study American history at any point? Not a, oh, you are, now you're fibbing. You're going to get your uh, grades to uh, drop down a little bit. So, um, at the inaugural address of President Kennedy, and you can't answer this if you're over 50, because uh, that's not fair, uh, what are the words that are most remembered from his inaugural address? Does anybody know? I'm going to wait now. I'm not going to give the answer. Is there a hand? You can paraphrase it. Flying to the moon. Flying to the moon. Okay, a moonshot. That's good. Not in the inaugural address, but good answer. <laughs> yes. Ich bin ein Berliner. Also not in the inaugural address. Ich bin ein Grazer. That's good. Okay, inaugural address, anybody? 
Yes. Thank you. Can we have a round of applause? So the answer is, ask not what your country can do for you, ask what you can do for your country. Where does he learn that when you get asked to give yourself, you have your best self in return? Where does he learn the guts to say, I'm not here to offer you something as your president, I'm here to ask? Where does he learn? He learns, in my view, from Rosemary. He learns from Rosemary. In this picture, you see him commissioning the first ever pu public political endeavor of a major industrialized nation to address the health care needs of people with intellectual disabilities. This is the gathering of the first ever president's scientific panel for the study of the causes and the treatment of people with intellectual disability. This panel makes recommendations that today are valid even in Austria now, as well as in the United States and every other country. Recommendations around improving health care, recommendations around improving training, recommendations around improving clinical services, recommendations around improving data and monitoring systems, recommendations around improving reimbursement and insurance systems, recommendations around improving employment opportunities, early childhood training, all made by the President's panel in 1962. The first industrialized nation to have an executive level recommendation and legislation to follow authorizing a major national undertaking around the care and treatment of people with intellectual disabilities. The challenge to you students remains the same today. In 1968, after the presidency ends, of course, all too briefly, we have the first Special Olympics event. Now here you see not the president, but my mother. Here you see a stadium that is not full, but empty. Here you see uh, people down on the field, about 1,000 people with intellectual disabilities who came from those institutions. In 1968, institutional populations in the United States are growing. In other words, they're getting bigger. In the middle of the civil rights movement, the women's movement, the peace movement, all over the United States and throughout Southeast Asia and Europe, where all these movements are beginning to catch hold, people with intellectual disabilities are still being added to institutions. But here you have an alternative model. Here you have a handful of people who say, we are going to bring those people out of the institutions into the public eye, and we're going to label them a new label, athlete. They're not going to be the Down syndrome games. They're not going to be the mentally retarded games. They're not going to be the disabled games. They're going to be the special games. And let's go one step further. Let's use the word Olympic. Now, if you have to ask yourself, as you might want ask me at some point, do you go, Tim, I hear this, Mark, I'm sure you hear it, do you go to the real Olympics? Does anybody, uh, you know, you might say to me, did you go to Rio to the real Olympics, Tim? Or are you going to, uh, uh, to Japan when the next real Olympics take place? So these are, these are not the real Olympics. This is the Olympics for people with an intellectual disability. Uh, they, they don't, they're not the highest, the fastest, the strongest on earth. They don't have bodies like we saw in Rio. They don't have times like that. They're going to run around the track, and here's what happens at the first event. They run around the track, and they're swimming in the pool, and they're throwing the javelin or jumping over high bars and stuff like that. And in one of the first races uh, around the track, they come. And you can imagine, maybe 14, 15 years old, never seen a finish line in their life, never been in a stadium in their life, never had anyone cheer for them in their life, never had a, a track line for them in their lives. And they're coming down to the home stretch, and the runner in first place stumbles and falls, and the other runners go by, except the runner in second place, who's his best friend. And just picture for yourself, Loneliness, shame, isolation, never having anyone ever cheer for you. And the finish line is right there, and you're about to cross it. And you stop, and you turn around, and you go back. And you pick up your friend, put the arm over your shoulder, 
and you turn around and you go to the finish line in last place. And so the question, of course, that the angel or the mystic might ask you is who won? Who won the race? Right at the outset, from the very first event, the athletes of Special Olympics come into the arena with a new definition of what it means to win. With a new definition of what it means to be the real Olympics. Definitions not bordered by who you beat, but rather by how you run your race. Not by who is the best, but what is your best. Every person in this room has an answer to the question of what is your best. Only one person in this room could be the best in this room. So if we define Olympic as who is the best, and we used this room as the population, as the total N of the, of the world, we'd have one winner. I'm not sure who it would be, but there'd be one winner who'd stand up here, and all the rest of us would cheer with admiration at the one person who could be great in the human family. But if we turn the table around and say, what is your best? What is the absolute best you can do? Everybody has a chance to come up here and stand up and put their arms up in the air and say, I've done it. I've done the absolute best I can. Is that an easy standard? Absolutely not. In some ways, it's the highest possible standard. What is your best? What is the best you can do as a student? The absolute best. Not what's your grade, not who did you beat, not what was your score, not what was everyone else's score, but what's your best? So the Special Olympics movement becomes energized becomes driven by not pity, not charity, not sympathy, but by this engine, this undiscovered engine of human greatness that comes from the athletes of Special Olympics and begins to create the movement we know today. Here's an example, Ajara Silla from Cote d'Ivoire. There she stands in, uh, in Shanghai at our games. 12 years old at the time, I'm not sure if you can see at the bottom what place she's in. Seventh. How many of you have a picture at home, your parents or your grandparents have a picture of you coming in seventh? But there she is. It's my best. How many of us have the guts to stand like that when you come in seventh, if it was the best you could do. To stand in front of anybody in your class and be proud of yourself when you do your best. This is the engine of the movement. This is why so many of us go, maybe you went to the pre-games. How many went to the pre-games? You know, so many of you saw maybe little moments like this, when a smile, when a hug, when a toughness, when a grit, when a perseverance, when a determined athlete crossed the finish line because he or she trained like crazy, gave everything they had, but didn't fit any normal definition of what we think of as being good. And yet somehow, you know, we had goosebumps or we stood and, and, and we felt something and maybe we choked up a little bit. Why? Because they reintroduced us to what is great about humanity, in my view. So this is where we're, what you're joining, and I know I'm running low on time, so I'm going to go quickly. Uh, you're not joining a, a, a movement that has an event every two years. You're joining a movement that is a community-based paradigm for a shift in science, in politics, in culture, in inclusion. Here's what it looks like today. We won't spend time on this. You'll just be tested on it when you get back to your classes. So hopefully you have a photographic memory. But up in the upper left-hand corner, you'll see a couple of quick numbers. First, 5.3 million athletes who participate every single year in a Special Olympics event. How can you have 5.3 million athletes in an event that takes place once a year? You can't. So in the second column over from the left at the top, you'll see where they play in 100,000, 108,000 local games a year. So while we have World Games coming up next March, you will have Graz Games and Styria Games in April and May and June and July. 
So here's the bad news. You volunteer for the World Games, you're stuck for life. And you will be asked to volunteer almost every weekend for the rest of your lives. Uh, but the good news is you'll have a good time doing it. Um, in the third column over at the bottom, let me just make brief mention of the fact that last year, we ran 899 healthy athletes clinics, meaning clinical settings where doctors and medical professionals, nurses, dentists, paraprofessionals came to games, popped up a tent, brought equipment, and volunteered to do a clinical screening at the event. Why do they have to, why do we invite people to come to games? We'll say more about that. But over 130,000 health exams were administered at Special Olympics events last year. So here's the additional bad news. Once you graduate, you will be invited to come for the rest of your lives in your professional capacity to run health screenings and health education opportunities for people yeah, in, 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 in Special Olympics. I'm going to skip some of these because we don't have time. So you say, well, why is Special Olympics involved in, uh, a health, uh, in, in health? After all, your sports, your inclusion, your teamwork, your training, your physical uh, development, but why health? Uh, here's the answer. Uh, we have found over the last 25 years that people with intellectual disabilities are largely forgotten in the healthcare debates around the world. Now, I'm not, this is not Austria. This is not the United States, this is not Europe, this is not Africa or Latin America or Asia or the Middle East. This is the world. If you look at most of the work that's done around healthcare reform, around healthcare justice, this population has typically been left out. And so in the face of that exclusion, we in the Special Olympics movement decided to use the platform we have, the sports platform we have, the joy platform we have, and add a powerful dose of health justice. So here's, here's, what, here's what the reality is. Individuals with disabilities have higher levels, higher prevalency of primary, secondary, and all kinds of comorbid conditions. Chronic disease, risk factors, they all exist partly as a function of diagnosis, but largely as a function of neglect. Here's what we find in those health clinics I just mentioned. Uh, untreated health, uh, tooth decay, uh, almost 40% uh, of our athletes in random screenings have untreated uh, tooth decay. Uh, almost 40% need glasses they don't have. Almost 40%, not 4%. Not 6%. These are not statistical, uh, you know, uh, variations. These are not minor variations that would produce statistical significance in a study. 6, 8, 10%. 40%. Go to the eye doctor or never go to the eye doctor or when they go, they get the wrong glasses or when they go, they get no glasses. Why? How could this possibly be true? Especially in a country like this that has such comprehensive and positive healthcare systems. Here's why, one doctor explained it to me. Tim, when the person with an intellectual disability comes into the office of the eye doctor, the doctor gives them, this is a doctor speaking, a quick and dirty. What's a quick and dirty, Tim asks. Get them in, get them out, they don't complain, they don't operate heavy machinery, they don't read long texts. Get them out of the waiting room, other patients make, are made uncomfortable. They don't read the eye chart. How can you give them an eye exam? Out the door. So here's a, just a quick sampling of realities from a, a series of countries. Uh, in the UK, National Health Service, comprehensive model of health care provision for all citizens. People with intellectual differences die 16 years prematurely because of undiagnosed or untreated conditions. We're going to go through these quickly. Um, in Germany, this is in the last five years, a family went years without realizing their son had hearing loss. No one tested. Uh, it was assumption was uh, intellectual disability. Uh, why bother? In the Netherlands, 35-year-old uh, goes to the doctor every year, is legally blind, but has never been given a pair of glasses because they can't read the eye chart. Eye chart has letters. Doctor goes, I don't have anything I can do with that. Uh, so off you go. 
Nonverbal teenager begins to have violent episodes, is treated with antipsychotics. Why? Because no one ever looked in the mouth, they hadn't seen a dentist in six years. Chronic, acute pain causing violent outbreaks in a nonverbal person, uh, and yet uh, no diagnosis. Germany, no cardiologist. This is, these are scenarios from families who come into the health screenings and report these scenarios. So here's what uh, maybe is most relevant to you folks. We did a survey some years ago uh, of medical and dental schools in the United States. Now, given this is not a European context and not an Austrian one, 81% uh, of the students trained in institutions like this in the United States said they were not getting any clinical training in the care of people with intellectual differences, none. So how can we fault the doctor who ends up, or the medical professional, or the statistician, or the technology uh, developer? How can we fault them if they develop technology that has nothing to do with the needs uh, or care of people with intellectual differences? They've had no exposure, even in medical schools. Deans say they don't have time. And yet, three quarters of the students your age say they'd like to care, and yet they have no training and no time. So we have multiple barriers to entry. Now let me just give you one very quick story. I think I'm almost out of time. Am I out of time, Barbara? It's an extra credit if I go over. So I went to do grand rounds at a major American hospital uh, to present to the doctors what we were finding in our health screenings. And the doctor who introduced me, a young uh, 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 physician, introduced me, and she put this poster up in the introduction. And this is like other posters uh, you see, maybe you see them, they're inspiring, you know, you see one that says teamwork, join in, and you see people rowing, or you see someone climbing a gigantic mountain, and you say grit, you know, follow through. This is uh, in that series, retards. We all know one. You see, you know, one bird that looks normal, the other bird doesn't. So she introduces me, and she says, I want to put this up, because I just took a picture of this poster with my iPhone in the faculty lounge in this hospital. A children's hospital. Children's hospital where probably a significant percentage of the patients who come through have some form of diagnosis of disability. And in the faculty lounge, over coffee, the healthcare professionals uh, are kind of getting a chuckle out of the idea that we all know a retard. This is not uh, 1920 when my aunt Rosemary was born. This is the 21st century. So the stigma runs deep, even in medicine. The medical model, in some ways, has become the point of attack for people with intellectual disabilities in their family. Why? Because the medical model has so governed our thinking as to create the sense in which people are the disability, that identity and diagnosis are the same thing. And in some ways, medicine has become the enemy. Many parents will say the worst experiences they've had are with doctors. Shocking. So many good doctors, so many people doing great work, so many people doing pioneering research. And yet, at some level, this kind of mentality has insinuated itself into the medical culture, and we need you to help us change this. So here are examples. On the left, an American, 42 years old. That's the status of his health care, his dental care. On the right, uh, a Turkish child who had, a, at the age of eight, um, a life-threatening, uh, uh, I actually wrote it down because I can never pronounce it, atrioventricular systal defect. Anybody know what that is? Atria, please raise your hand. Okay, so we have, I just want to make sure I'm in the right room. <laughs> uh, undiagnosed at the age of eight, um, uh, threatening her life. Diagnosed by a doctor with a stethoscope at a healthy athlete's screening. Stethoscope, doctor, life-saving diagnosis, eight years old, not diagnosed up until that point. 
So here's Austrian statistics in case people are saying, well, wait a second, that doesn't apply to us. Some a little better than the global average. 26%. World disease is a disaster in this population. It's just a disaster. Need glasses, 50%. In Austria, 2016, 2017, 2015. So uh, we can look at this a couple of other ways. I know some of you are in statistics or in technology or in monitoring systems. Uh, the Pomona study uh, gave us some sense of some of the data around the actual comorbidity and mortality rates uh, amongst people with intellectual disabilities, not much. But we do know that the disparities do exist, that there are over 250,000 citizens in this nation who have an intellectual challenge. Uh, that there is limited training, uh, few professorships. Uh, if you go to your professors and ask them how many of them have a specialization or specialized training in the care and treatment or technology or monitoring systems or uh, all these kinds of things, very few, not unlike other countries. So you're in some ways at a handicap because if you go to your professors and say, hey, I really want to get into this, I really want to understand this, most of your professors will be in the same position you're in. Uh, which means we need young people to be the uh, vanguard of change, which means we have a sacred trust, back to our first point. So we have, health, uh, we have healthy athletes here. We'll have a healthy athletes uh, program here at the Games uh, in uh, 2017. And we need your help to, uh, I'm going to go through this quickly. Here are the screening systems. Again, all this we can make available to you, these slides, so you don't have to write them down. But this is what we're doing today at the screenings. This is what you'll see in 2017, screenings are podiatrists, screenings for optometrists, screenings run by dentists, screenings run by PTs and OTs, all kinds of screenings to help uh, people with intellectual disabilities who don't get the care typically in the typical system to get it when they come to the games here. And you'll see people from 100 countries. So for those of you who have interest in, develop, in the developing world, in multiple population kinds of uh, systems and so on, look at ways in which disease evolves and which disorders evolve in multiple cultural settings, you'll get a chance to see all that uh, during uh, the games in 2017. This is what it looks like. Um, we've developed. Uh, for instance, uh, eye tests that don't use letters, so people can use shapes and point to shapes. Um, minor modification to a traditional eye exam that makes all the world of difference to a person who doesn't use language or doesn't, use, uh, doesn't read. Um, and some of these games you'll see large screenings, uh, uh, and again, I've mentioned most of this already. So the second half of what we're trying to do and what we're inviting you to do is help us create healthy communities. So on the one hand, you have screenings at the games. And then on the other hand, you have, well, wait a second. Why is the system off? And so rather than continue to try to catch the, you know, the one person uh, like the James Pierce who you saw with the oral cavity that was completely diseased, what, rather than try to catch them, at our games, we're also now trying to engage practitioners, healthcare providers, policy makers, in creating what we call healthy communities, um, where people sign up, where people commit to ongoing care and retraining of people uh, for people with intellectual disabilities. So we have wellness clubs. Uh, we have uh, uh, networks of dental providers, networks of pediatricians, networks of cardiologists who commit to providing supports to people with intellectual disabilities. Here you see a healthy communities demonstration on hand sanitation and water cleanliness. You see in the background the guy in the red shirt holding up his camera, taking a picture. That's me. Uh, <laughs> uh, this is in Malawi uh, at a school uh, for children with intellectual disabilities and uh, where we have also, we're doing this work with UNICEF and USAID um, around hand sanitation. I mean, it doesn't sound complicated, but as those of you who study these issues know, it's a gigantic issue for disease transmission, uh, not only in the developing world, but elsewhere. Um, so how can we get public policies? How can we get funding streams? How can we encourage research? 
uh, by getting medical professionals to commit to creating networks, healthy communities to take success to the local level. So the WHO report on uh, disability is not unlike the President's report I mentioned earlier from 1962. It calls for financial measures, it calls for changes in research practice, it calls for changes in the training of healthcare professionals, it calls for commitments from individual health professionals to broaden their practices. Uh, what was true in 1962 is true in 2011 and it's true in 2016 in October right here in Graz. We want this country to lead. And you think to yourself, if you're in your late teens, early 20s, early 30s, well, okay, that leadership that belongs to someone uh, up in the front row, president, the dean, uh, professors. Uh, with no disrespect to the president or the dean or the professors, it doesn't. Leadership does not belong to them, not in this field. Leadership in this field has always been owned by young people and by families. I'm sorry to say, it has never been top down, it has always been bottom up. Uh, and so the invitation today is not just for Austria to be a leader, but for you to be a leader. And so you could ask yourself, uh, are you willing? You know, are you thinking to yourself, I hope he doesn't call on me. <laughs> Or, you know, I'm sure it's the person to my left who will take this on, not me. I've got class later, and I've got, you know, a party to go to tonight, and I've got a family, and this, that, and the other thing. Uh, I'm interested. I came to the class. I got my credit, but not a leader. Uh, I hope that's not the case. Uh, we need you to volunteer at the games. We need you to become an influencer for this subject. We need you to raise your hand in class all the time and ask your professors, how does this affect people with intellectual disability? Where is this research leading for people with an intellectual challenge? What are the implications for this training for a person with Down syndrome or Williams syndrome or other genetic disorders? What are the implications for a person who's nonverbal? How do we use this diagnostic technique for a person who's non-ambulatory? Keep your hand up. Challenge your community, your university, your faculty members, yourselves to think outside the box, to think outside the normal curve. So James Pierce can become James Pierce. One good dentist. One dentist who gave the time, the care, the attention to treat James Pierce like a human being, not like a diagnosis, not like a disorder, like a human being. Kentucky, United States, one dentist. Now, I would submit to you that if your career is defined by a before and after picture like this taken on an iPhone, this is not photoshopped, this is not trying to sell a drug, this is not trying to uh, make an advertisement uh, for a big uh, firm or anything like that. This is just a dentist taking a before and after picture in his clinic in Kentucky in the United States of America. Uh, if your practice, if your professional life is defined by one or two pictures like this, I would hope you would join me in thinking that your life uh, and your career has been a success. Let me close with this one picture. Uh, this is a picture of a group of athletes who participated in the 2003 games in Ireland. Um, and on the right in the wheelchair is uh, with his hands like this, you see a young man named Donal Page. Donal was born healthy in Portumna, Ireland. Uh, his father is a dairy farmer, his mother the mother of seven. They live a simple life, about 100 head of cattle, uh, on a farm in the west of Ireland in County Galway. Uh, at about uh, uh, 18 months, Donal came down with a brain infection. I don't know the exact diagnosis, but within about uh, four hours of having a fever, he was in the intensive care unit and the priest was called. He was given the last rites of the church in Ireland. Um, he almost died that night. He survived into the next day. Two days later, he had a series of seizures and again was given the last rites of the church on Good Friday, as it turned out that year, um, but survived. And about six weeks later, uh, the doctor turned to his parents and said, you can take him home if you like. Uh, he's lost language, he's lost large functions, large components of his brain function, he's lost his uh, motor control, 
you can care for him for the rest of your life, uh, feed him, bathe him, uh, take care of his hygiene. And so uh, Sean and Mary Page took home little Donal to raise him like their other brothers and sisters, just as my grandparents did, only in Donal's case with very severe challenges. By the time 2003 rolls around, he's 18, he's in his wheelchair, and he's invited to come to Dublin to the World Games where he is uh, going to compete in the motor activities. And unbeknownst to me, I get a call midday, midweek through the games from the president of Ireland, Mary McAleese. Her office calls to say, the president would like to go out to the Special Olympics events to see them herself. And I say, fantastic, we'll take you to the track. She'll see people run 100 meters in 11 seconds. No, 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 she's going to go to motor activities. It's like, well, motor activities is people with very severe disabilities. Uh, she's, I'm thinking to myself, she's not going to be impressed. I mean, I want to show her that people with intellectual disabilities can. I said, no, no, this, the new, brand new pool, we've got athletes, we've got a half a dozen athletes who have swum races in Olympic times at the pool. Wouldn't the president, no, no, sorry, she's going to meet you, 10 o'clock, motor activities. I said, okay, we'll go to motor activities. So we end up, I meet her, greet, you know, at the front door, shake hands, so proud, thank you for coming, Madam President. We walk into a room almost about this size. In fact, it was very close to this. We sit down right here where Linda is sitting. I'm sitting next to the president. I'm in a tie like this at a sporting event because I'm nervous. We have the president there. I hope she's going to be impressed. And the first person to come out is that young man in the lower right-hand corner of the picture, Donald Page. And they wheel him out and put his wheelchair in the middle and put a little table in front of him. And his activity is to lift the bean bag from one side of the table to the other. And so there he goes, and the announcer comes over the air, and his mom and dad have driven up separately from Galway. It's about a five-hour drive, and they left very early in the morning to get there by 10. I had their cup of tea uh, earlier, and they're sitting in the back. And the room is full, by the way, surprisingly, because it's motor activities. I expected there to be no one there. So Donal, as the beanbag is placed down in front of him, and sort of he takes in the room, looks around, and. And off you go, uh, and we're sitting there watching him. And he goes to you know, move his arm a little to get the bag. And you can see he's got some, some paralysis challenge. Um, and we're all watching him, and it becomes kind of clear that he can't get his hand to go. It just, he's moving and lurching. and. He's got, he still has a smile on his face, but his hand won't go. And I'm taking my deep breaths and thinking, whew, this is embarrassing. You know, here we have the president of the nation. We have an athlete here who can't, in my distorted mind, thinking he can't even move his hand. What a great demonstration of Olympic greatness. And so it's silent like this. And a silent room in most situations, unless you're doing meditation class, is uncomfortable. This goes on for three minutes until at three minute mark, Donald's hand finally flops onto the bag. And over the next 18 minutes, Donald Page's hand comes slowly, haltingly, up across his desk. When he gets up here, you know, now we're cheering. The whole place is starting to cheer. You know, you go, lad, go, lad. And I talked to his dad later, and he said, you know, I was watching Donald. And I was just thinking what I've been telling the doctors all these years, give him a bit of time. He could do it if you give him a bit of time. And at 18 minutes, the bag goes down. And the place is standing, you know, cheering like it's a World Cup final. You know, and I look over at the president, her eyes are, my eyes 
we're, we're all blown away by this one athlete, by Donald Page. Now, you all are soccer fans, I hear, football fans. And, you know, you've heard of Lionel Messi and uh, this person and that person, and you think they're all great. And they are. They are great. But they're no Donald Page. And so the invitation to you is, you know, give yourselves a bit of time. Give your patients a bit of time. Give your practice a bit of time. Give yourselves the opportunity to see what I, even after 20 years of work in this field, had missed, which was that the greatest athlete might well be at the motor activities venue, not at the pool and not at the track. And that the recognition of human greatness is not always about what we think it will be, not what we think will impress, but about what comes from within. And when you look at what comes from within, you look beyond the label, beyond the diagnosis to the person. And when you look at the person, you can create, I hope and believe, health justice for all. Thank you very much for your attention. <laughs>